that I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. Yeah. I'm glad that I know that my name's been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and never be erased, never be blotted out. Hey, I've got people on the other side, amen, that I love and care about, and I don't want to get to see them again. And the more I think about heaven, amen, the more I want yeah. to be there. Amen. amen. I love yeah. that song. All right, well, now it's preaching time, amen. 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 I like all the fellowship, amen, but it's preaching time, and that's the main thing, amen. And I'm excited about Brother Jonathan Cruz coming and preaching tonight, and uh, let me say this, I'm proud, I'm very proud of all the young men that we have amen. in our church, I'm proud of all the young ladies too, but I'm proud of these preacher boys standing and, and preaching God's Word. Now, let me say, it's not easy, it's not easy being a teenager serving God, amen. it's right. not easy being a, a teenager boy and serving God. Amen. Right. It's not easy to, to get up here, get prepared, study up. You know, they got school. Uh, Jonathan, I, I wouldn't brag on him a little bit. Uh, I guess as far as, as far as we know right now, you're still going to be valedictorian in your graduating class. Amen. So he's got a lot of stuff to do. Amen. He's got, he's got college on his mind. And, uh, but you know what? He's, he's kept God number one in his life. Amen. 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 And, you know, that's the main reason why I wanted to do youth revival this week is because a lot of times the focus that we that that we put on church sometimes we put focus on the, these these you know big revivals and these big name preachers and everybody comes out for these big name preachers you know what we're preaching the same about the same jesus that's right Amen. Yeah. we're preaching about the same heaven come on Amen. and i don't care if it's a big name preacher or not they're big in my sight for Amen. understanding and preaching God's word, amen. amen. And I'm proud of every one of our young men that we've had preach this week. So, Jonathan, you go ahead and come on and preach to us what God's laid on your heart. Amen. Those of you that have your Bibles, if you would, turn to Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7, start at verse 1. The Bible says, Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the, all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside it's beside the well of Herod, so that the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from the Mount Gilead, and there return of the people. Twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee, for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with, with thee. And of whom, and of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon. Everyone that laughed of the water with his tongue, as a dog laughed, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that bowed down upon his knees to drink. And the number of, the, of them that laughed, putting their hands to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees uh, to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that laughed, will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into, the, into thine hand. And let all the other people go, every man unto his place. So the people took big shoes in their hand, in their hand, and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those three hundred men. And host of many was beneath him in the valley. At verse sixteen, the Bible says, and he divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And read twenty through twenty-two. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with them. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow. Even, even throughout all the hosts and the hosts fled to Meshetah in Zerath and to the border of Abel and to Tappan. All right? We don't forget about that. All right, let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for all your many blessings, God. I thank you for giving me this opportunity, Lord, to stand behind my pastor's pulpit, Lord, and preach your word. God, I know I'm not worthy, Lord, but I pray that you use me, Lord, here tonight. Stir us up, God. Get us excited, Lord, and want to serve you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This story here, the story of Gideon and the 300, is probably one of my favorite 
stories in the Bible. If you have never taken the time to read it or never uh, taken or never heard it, I recommend that you read it. And uh, chapter six as well leads up to the uh, battle here. But for those of you who have never heard the story, I'll briefly run through it by way of an introduction. <clears throat> so here we see Israel is going through the roller coaster that they always go through. At one point, they're serving God, and, and they're putting God first, and then after that, they don't serve God, and then they put God first again, and they serve Him, and then they don't. And they're going through this roller coaster with God, and then, but God lets them know whenever they're not serving Him, and He lets them feel the consequences. Right. But at this time, Israel is faced by the Midianites. You can find that in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And, uh, and God sends an angel down to talk to Gideon, and he's told... But he is the one being chosen to conquer the, the enemy, the Midianites. Gideon, is, in uh, verse uh, chapter 6 and verse 16, we find that Gideon tells that he uh, is actually... Here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Or uh, 15, sorry. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor, and mine say, and I am the least in my father's house. Gideon says... Uh, when the angel of the Lord comes to tell him, hey, you're the one that's going to go and you're the one that's going to bring the Israelites out of the mid hands of the Midianites. And Gideon, he tells he says, well, well my family's so poor and, and, I, and even of my family, I'm the least of this family. I, I'm the very least. Why me? But God says that he'll, he'll be with them and he'll guide them on the way through. God will always be with us. I thank God for that. Yeah, Gideon, wow. uh, after that, Gideon gathers all the men that he can find because common sense tells you if the Midianites have hundreds of thousands of men, you know, you're going to want to get as many people as you can to fight against them, right? Man, right. Well, God doesn't think so. So God says, you know what? You have too many people. The, the Midianites already have hundreds of thousands of men. Gideon can get 32,000 men, but God says that's too many. He doesn't want, he doesn't want the Israelites to think that, that if they win, then it's because of them, because they, they did it themselves. God wants them to know that it was because of him. Yeah. All right. So he started with thirty-two thousand, and God tells him. He says, "If there's anyone who's afraid, anyone who is who is scared, even the smallest amount, tell him to go home." And so he did, and he was left with ten thousand men. So then God tells him, "That's still too many. Ten thousand is still too many." So God tells uh, he tells Gideon to take his men down to the water, and he tells him to drink of the water, and those who who brought the water to themselves, who were looking, who brought the water with their hands to their mouths, those are the ones that he kept. Those who just went down and just went face first and got the water, now, he, he said, send them home. And so Gideon was then left with 300 men. 300 men to face hundreds of thousands of men. But God, he knows what he's doing. Right. Only 300 men were there in the battle. Um, men who were not afraid and men who were vigilant, men who looked out and who were aware of their surroundings. Right. Now, now that he's got his army, it's time to go to war. And so he splits up his, his army into three groups of 100 men. And he doesn't arm them with swords. He doesn't give them weapons. He doesn't give them a shield. He gives them a lamp, a trumpet, and an empty pitcher. Because that's how you win wars. All right? right. So he gives them these three weapons of... Uh, uh, and, you know, obviously through their mind, they're probably thinking, well, we're all going to die. There's only 300 of us. We've got a lamp, a pitcher, and a trumpet. I guess we can, uh, we can just call for help. I guess that's what we're doing. So all, the, all these men, even though they, even though they realize that they're, they're probably the underdogs here, they realize that they're the ones that, that, are, that may not survive. They put their faith and their trust in God, and they they, yeah, they trust that He's going to bring them through. Right, amen. So Gideon tells them to follow His lead, and He tells them when He blows His trumpet and He breaks the pitcher and He yells, "The sword of the Lord and of Gideon!" And all the men do the same. And then the Midianites, all they hear is a loud noise, and they wake up, and it's dark, and all they they just go around and they just start fighting, and they fight and they kill everything that they see, everything that, that they come in contact with. But what they don't realize is that they're killing their own people. So God, He used the uh, the Israelites here. He used this, these three hundred men without swords, without weapons, Come on. without anything that you would really use to fight an army with. Yeah. And they didn't even have to lift a finger but to blow a trumpet. 
and to bring a picture. Amen. They didn't have to go and they didn't have to go and fight these these hundreds of thousands of men because they fought themselves and they fled and they, they left. They were so confused that they started fighting their own people. Uh, it doesn't matter how small you are. It doesn't matter uh, how what trials you're going through. It doesn't matter how, how big of a battle you think you're going through. God is always there with you. Amen. Sometimes God will bring you down to something small so that He can use you to overcome right. something great for His good. Amen. Right. I want to talk to you about, uh, as quickly as I can here, about the three types of soldiers found here that should be in the army of God. Yeah. Number one, a valiant soldier. Valiant means boldly courageous, brave, stout-hearted, heroic. These were the soldiers that God kept in His army. These were the ones that, that God wanted here. And when He first uh, started weeding them out, He said, if there's anyone who has fear in their heart, anyone who fears whatsoever, send them home. God doesn't want Christians who are scared of just to stand up for His for His glory. He doesn't right. want, He wants yeah. Christians who are not ashamed. Christians who yeah. want to stand up and who want to proclaim the Word of God. He wants Christians who will stand and stand firm. Yeah. You can't have fearful soldiers. If we had soldiers over uh, in the Middle East who were scared, we wouldn't make any advancements. We wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't be able to win wars. We, they would cower in their corners and then where would we be? Who knows? That we, you can't have fearful soldiers That's in right. the war. Right. Fearful soldiers won't make advancements. Christians who are filled with fear won't grow in the Lord. That's they right. fear right. because fear runs their life. Fear begins to take over, and that everything becomes all that runs through their life. You're right. And fear, fear just begins to run their life, and, and they don't have many Christians don't have a backbone nowadays. They don't want to stand up right. and say what's wrong. They don't want to stand up and say, "Hey, this sin is wrong," and and they don't want to take a stand because they might hurt somebody's feelings. Come on. Come on. But that's not what God wants. He wants Christians who, who have courage and who are going to stand up and no matter no matter who who is against them, no matter the situation, He wants Christians who are going to stand firm and stand that's up. Right. Yeah. Many Christians don't have their faith and trust in God uh, to realize that He'll bring them through. Yeah. What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of rejection? The biggest fear that man faces is rejection. We all, we all fear rejection. We want to be accepted by everyone. We want everyone to like us. We, want, right. we want to have friends. The Bible says in Psalms 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Amen. What can man do unto me? Amen. What is man going to do to you? They're going to call you names? Come on. Pick on you? Is that the most they're going to do? All that they're going to do to you is they may pick on you. They may call you a name. They may call you toilet boy. They, might, they may call you a Bible thumper. I mean, but what does that do to you? That's right. It does nothing. That's right. It doesn't do anything to you. It Amen. should discourage you. Amen. We should be courageous. We should stand up and say, you know what? I do love God and Amen. I proclaim it from the, from the mountain top. It doesn't matter who comes against me. It Come all on. matters is that God is number one in my life. Are you right. afraid of the enemy? Are you afraid of Satan? Are you afraid of the world? See, a lot of people, they're afraid of what Satan's going to do uh, or what Satan can do or what this world, its influence on us. But spoiler alert, guys, we win in the end. Yeah, man. Yeah. In the end, it doesn't matter the trials that we go through. Right. It doesn't matter yeah. the situations that we're in. We win in the end. Yeah. In the end, if you read the last chapter of this book, we win. Yeah. We win. The Christians win. Yeah. Why, not yeah. yeah. why not stand? Why not, why not stand and say, I love God and I'm going to serve God to yeah. Yeah. A lot of Christians, they, they're afraid of slipping up. We're afraid of, because many people, they put us on uh, like a high, a high pedestal. They put us on a higher standard because we, we claim that we love God and that we live by morals. And oh, we live by, right. yeah. by, uh, by these morals that God sets forth in His Word. And, and we're afraid of falling. A lot of Christians are afraid of falling. They don't want to slip up. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16, For a just man follows seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Did you notice there it says, For a just man followed seven times. Seven is the number of completion. I think, I think that that was put there for a reason. It doesn't matter how many times you fall down. It doesn't matter if, if at that seventh time it should be over. A just man will rise again and who will stand up and say that I love God. It doesn't matter how many times they fall. God will always love them. God will always accept them. And God will always be with them. Amen. If, the, if there's anything that we should fear, we should fear God. Yeah, that's right. Not just because of what He can do or what He can allow to happen to us, but we should respect God because He is God. He's our Creator. Yeah, he, he gave us all that we have. If there's anybody, anything that we should fear, it's God. Yeah. We need to stand up courageously and realize 
And no matter how big the battle, no matter how big the struggle, no matter how big the trial that we're going through, God is always in control. Amen. Number two, Christians need to be vigilant. Amen. Vigilant means keenly watchful to detect danger, wary, over, uh, ever awake and alert, sleeplessly watchful. Isn't that what revival is for? It's to revive us, to, right. to wake us up, to show us that, that we need to be alert and be watchful of our right. surroundings. Amen. That's the kind of soldiers that God wants. He wants soldiers who are who not only are looking down the path that he'd have us to go, but are also aware of everything that's around them. It's like when you're driving. You know, when you're driving, you, you have to look at the road ahead of you. You have to look at everything ahead of you. But you also have to be aware of everything that's around you. Yeah, you yeah. have to be aware of the kid who's over in this yard playing with the ball. You have to be aware of, of the car that's coming this way. And that's what we have to we have to do as Christians. We have to look down the path that God would have us to go down, but we also need to be aware that there are people who are, who are going to come against us. There are people who are going to try and stand against us, who are going to attack us from this yeah. side and attack us yeah. from that side, right. attack us right. from behind. Yeah. We need to be aware of this and be vigilant. We also need to be vigilant of, of when God's coming back. We need to be vigilant yeah. of, yeah. of everything. Look, look around you. Pay attention to all your surroundings. God wants us to be focused on the path, but also be uh, focused on our surroundings. Be aware of adversity. Know who they are and, when they're, and where they're coming from. What are you distracted by? Mom. Are you distracted by sin? We all have pet sins in our lives, I'm sure. We all have impure thoughts. Satan, he attacks the mind. That's what he likes to do. Because when he attacks the mind, he can attack... Uh, he, what your mind controls your actions. If he attacks your mind, he can control your actions. And that's what he wants. He wants us to mess up. He wants us to slip. People want to see us fall. They want to see because we say, hey, we have a loving God. We have a, a, the, the only God that actually exists. They want to see His fault. They want to see failure. Right. And what are, you, are you distracted by the sin that, that is in this world, the sin that's taken over your life? Get rid of the distractions. Are you distracted by circumstance? Are you distracted by the trials and the tribulations that are going on in your life? You know, uh, a lot of times uh, I remember when I was preaching about Peter when he walked on the water. He had, he had a path that he was going on. He was walking to Jesus, but he got distracted by the storms of life. He got distracted by the storm that was going on around him, yeah. and so he began to sink. See, we get distracted a lot of times by our trials and by our tribulations. We, we get distracted by what we're, what we're going through, and then we begin to lose where we're at. Right. Man. We begin to lose uh, the path that we're supposed to be following. We get distracted. Uh, are you distracted by the world? Are you distracted by your friends, your family, uh, TV, internet, anything else that Zig mentioned last Good. night? Are you distracted by any of these things that are turning you away from God? Yeah. No. Are you distracted? Are, are they are they blocking your sight from what you need to be focused on? Are you, are you distracted by other Christians? A lot of Christians... Uh, they, they begin to focus on other Christians while uh, walk with God. That's good. You know, you know, Christians, be, they, they focus on what Brother Samuel is doing over here. Come on. Uh, Samuel, I don't think he should have picked that song. I don't know if we should have sang that. Or Samuel, I don't know if, if I don't think that was the right song for the choir. Right. Don't be focused on what God's going through someone else. Be focused That's on right. the football. Yeah, That's right. Be focused yeah. on yourself. That's right. right. You know, uh, a lot of people here, I mean, there may be people here who, be, who may be thinking, you know, there's not a lot of people here. Don't be focused on that. Yeah. Right. Be focused, be focused Come on, on that's good. Yeah, right. yeah. It's like lighting that's a good. candle. It doesn't matter how uh, it doesn't matter how many people are here tonight. It's like lighting a candle. All you really need is to light one candle. Man. Oh, light that candle that's good. Yeah. Amen. 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 When you light all these candles, they can light other ones. It starts with you. It starts with oh, hey, that's that's good. Good. Amen. And if, Amen. If we stop focusing on on our own walk with God and we start focusing on other people's walk with God. Then our flame begins to go out. Right. Right. You're right. We need to we need to focus on ourselves and make sure that we're on fire for God. That's and right. That fire will You're spread right. to someone else, will yeah. spread to others, will spread right. to churches, to other cities, to other countries. We need to we need to focus on ourselves in our own Christian walk. Amen. Are you distracted by yourself? Are you distracted by me, me, me? It's all about me. It's all about what I want. I don't want to go out on a Saturday because takes up my time. I don't want to go to church on, on a Thursday night because I can be at home watching Netflix. Come on. I don't want to go to church because it, it takes away from me. It Come inconveniences on. me. Come Make on. God number one. God number one in our lives. Be number one on God's mind. Yeah. When uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross, yeah. why, yeah, why right. can't God be number one in our lives? That's right. right. Be ready to stand. Wake up and be vigilant. Man. Look around you. Be alert. Number three, you need to be a vessel. A person, re vessel is defined as a person regarded as a holder or receiver of something. 
God wanted those who would hold fast to what was given to them, such as orders. A soldier who won't hold to the orders that is given to them won't make it far. If a soldier right. is given orders and they don't follow what, what they're told to do, then they're not going to make it far. Yeah. They're not going to go, they're not going to be able to, they may not even survive Mom. if they don't follow the orders that are given to them. God wants, he, he wants us to hold fast to His commandments. He wants us to hold fast to what He's told us to do, to spread the gospel, to go out and to give the gospel to every every living creature here, to give the gospel to those out there in the world. Man, man. He wants to use us. He wants us to, to give our all to Him. He wants us to, to give all that we have to Him. For callings, he's, he's given each and every one of us a calling aside from knocking on doors, aside from giving, uh, spreading the gospel. He's given us callings such as preaching, teaching, singing, uh, whatever else God has called you to do. He wants you to be a vessel and to do what He'd have you to do. That's right. We need to also hold on to our Christian values, the values that are given to us in this book. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yes. This world is trying to take those away from us. It's right. oh. fighting against us. They're trying to get rid of all of our Christian values, get rid of this book. And guess Come what? The world is winning. Right. Because Christians are not standing up and they're not saying, hey, this is my religion. This Amen. is my oh. religion. Amen. This is my God. And then, and then they, stand, they stand down and they let the world take over. Yeah, that's right. We need to let God use us and fight back. Yeah. It's holding you back. It's your relationship with God holding you back. Come on. Your Bible reading, your Bible studying, your Come prayer on. life, your testimony. All of that affects your service for yeah. God. If you don't have a close relationship with God, you're not going to be going out. You're not going to be going out and spreading the gospel and giving someone a gospel track and, and telling someone about God's grace. It all affects it. It affects your faith. Here, if, if these uh, 300 men, if they didn't have the faith, if they didn't believe that God would bring them through it, they all would have died. I believe they all would have died if they did not believe that God, yeah. and they didn't follow the orders, and they didn't believe that God would bring them through it. Right. I, I watched a video on YouTube, and it was talking about getting right with God. See, and it, it explained that the problem that we have with getting right with God is that we try to get right with God. Mom. Instead of letting God make us right. Man. Amen. That's See, good. We always try to, we focus on our own selves. We always try to, to do it all on our own. But we're not perfect. We can't fix ourselves because our, our view of perfection is altered. It's twisted. It's not what's right. You know, how can we expect to fix ourselves if we're not perfect? Yeah. We can. Mom. Um, it's like if, if, I, um, if I was at school and I didn't understand how to do something in chemistry and I didn't know how to balance an equation, I asked the teacher uh, how to balance the equation. She says, well, I can I can teach you if you want. And I said, no, I'm going to go learn it myself. And then I'm going to come back and then you can teach me. That's yeah. good. It doesn't That's make right. sense, right? That's right? If I go and I learn something myself, how how can you teach me what I already know? But the thing is, if I try to teach myself, I don't really know it. I won't understand it because I don't have a basis of it. Yeah. Yeah. So God wants to use us to do something great for Him. We just have to let Him. Man, man. As Christians, we're in a spiritual warfare. It's time that we make up our minds to serve God, to protect this book, to protect what it says, the values that it holds. We need to be, we need to be uh, valiant because God is in control. We need to realize that God is in control so we can stand right. firm and we don't have to fear what man can do to us. We don't have man. to fear what this world is going to do to us because yeah. God is in control. We need man. to be vigilant. Be aware of when and where adversity is coming and know how to combat it. Man. We need to be vessels, ready to be used at any given call, whenever God tells us to do something, we need to be ready to be used by Him. Amen. If Christians will be valiant, vigilant vessels, then we will always be victorious over this whole sin stream. That's right. Amen. 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 Everybody, will stand your feet, every head bowed, every eye closed, and nobody looking around here tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I look around here tonight. This altar is open. I think the message he preached tonight hit the nail right on the head. Tell him there's been some good preaching this week. He hit the nail right on the head. What kind of soldier are you? What kind of Christian are you? What battle are you facing? Are you doing like these 300 here? How strong is your faith? Have you lost faith in the Lord? Have you lost faith? Have you lost your way? Are you sidetracked? Are you going off to let the world drag you off in different directions? Have you lost your focus on the Lord? If that's you here tonight, this altar's open. That's what revival's all about. Hey, not a one of us in here tonight are perfect. Not a one of us in here tonight is perfect. Every one of us 
deal with different things. And every one of us go through battles. And every one of us face different things. And I want you to know tonight that God wants to use you. Hey, you, you're a chosen vessel of the Lord. God wants to take your life and He wants to mold it and shape it in what He would have it to be so that He can use you for His honor and for His glory. I wonder how many folks here tonight with purpose in their hearts dedicate themselves to the Lord and His service here tonight. I wonder how many folks will make their way down to the altar tonight and commit themselves to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you. I wonder how many folks tonight be willing to break their burden, break their battle, whatever it is that they're facing, to bring it down to this altar and give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. I say this all the time, but it's the truth. Cast all of your cares upon Him. Why? For He cares for you. God cares about you. That's why He's our personal Lord and Savior. He cares about each and every one of us. He cares about our personal needs. He cares about our personal battles. And He wants to help us. But God will never force Himself on us. He'll never force Himself on us. But He will extend that nail scarred hand out to you. Say, here I am. I want to help you. Here I am. I can lift you up. Here I am. I can make you strong again. Here I am. I can strengthen you and move in your life and make things good again. Are you willing to make that step and trust the Lord? The message tonight, He talked about the characteristics of being a good soldier for the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but we are in a spiritual battle. We're at war. There's a spiritual warfare that we're going that we're, that we're going through and that we're facing in this life. And the devil's going to do everything that he can to throw a curveball at us and knock us off our gate. The Lord Jesus Christ said he'd be by our side. He said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. You know the reason why it seems like that whatever it is that you're facing or going through, whatever the care of life is that you're that you're dealing with, you know why it seems so bad and it seems so rough and it seems like the waves of life just continue to crash upon you? Because just like Peter, you lost focus. You're taking your eyes off the Lord. You need to get focused back in on the things of God. You need to get focused back in on the Lord. You need to get or have that relationship restored with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you where it starts. It starts at this altar. Humbling yourselves before the Lord. Sam preached about that last night. How we have to humble ourselves before the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want to see revival in my personal life. Amen? I want, I want to see revival in the whole. I want to see revival in our church. That's right. The only way that's going to happen is we go to the Lord and humble ourselves before Him and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, I can't do it. I have nothing on my own. Lord, I need you. This altar's open tonight. Several folks have already come. Every hand out, every eye closed. I want to ask you some questions here tonight. And I want you to be honest with yourself. And honest with the Lord. Nobody's looking around. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, I'm going through a battle. I just want you to pray for me. I want you to slip up your hand. All I want to do is pray for me. I'm not going to single anybody out. I see that hand. Anybody would say, Preacher, I'm going through a battle. I see that hand. Preacher, I'm struggling with some things. I'm struggling with some things. This altar's open. Why don't you come? Why don't you come tonight? God can touch you. God can strengthen you. Won't some of you men come around and gather around and pray up here tonight? Whatever it is that you're facing, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody's looking around. There were several hands that went up and said, Preacher, I'm in a battle. Preacher, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with some things. I, I've got some struggles. And it, I, I can't make it on my own. And it seems like everything that I've tried, I just fall flat on my face. Don't you just lift up your hands. I want you to know this altar's open tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to help you. The Lord wants to strengthen you. He wants to move in your life. He wants to move in your family. Hey, let me say this tonight. I, I, I preached a message before on let God be God. Let me God. Let God be God in your life. The other reason why it seems like sometimes that God is not God in our lives is because we don't allow God to be God in our lives. Just like Jonathan was talking about tonight. A lot of times we, we leave God and we try and we go to handle, try to go handle things on our own. We try to fight life's battles on our own. And God says, here I am. Let me be God. Let me take control. Let me move in. Let me fight the battle for you. And you know what we need to do? We need to put self aside. Let go of that selfish pride. The Bible says pride goes before fall. Pride goes before destruction. Pride shall bring you low. 
Let go of that pride. Say, God, here I am. God, I can't do it. Lord, I need you. Lord, please take this situation I have in my life. Lord, fight the battle for me. I preached not too long ago how to slay the giant in your life. David fought the life. You know how he was able to defeat the life? It wasn't in his own strength. He was nothing in the sight of that giant. You're nothing in the sight of the giant you have in your life. But David gave the battle to the Lord. He told the lie. He said, you come to me with a spear and a sword. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he gave the battle to the Lord. And the Lord got of that stone killed that giant who was in his life. God wants to kill the giant problem that you have in your life. God wants to kill the giant's battle that you have in your life. God wants to kill the giant struggle, the giant addiction, the giant pet sin that you have in your life. God wants to kill that thing. Let him turn it over to the Lord. Put it in his hands. That's right. You'll never go wrong. Never go wrong. Put it in God's hands. Let God fight the battle for you. The 300 that Jonathan preached about tonight, God fought that battle for them. They didn't have to do anything except just trust God. And God took care of the whole situation. We need to be the same way. That's right. In everything in every area of our life, just trust God. Man. Give it to God. And God will take control. My God can do anything. Amen. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. That's the God that I serve. That's, That's the God of this Bible. That's the God that we worship. Amen. That's the God that sent Jesus down to this earth to die for my sins. That's, right. that's the God that, that has made, made a way for me to go to heaven. And that's the God that I'm going to worship for all eternity. Hey, he's the God that created everything. And if He can create everything, if He can speak everything into existence, He certainly can handle the situation you have in your life. Amen. That's my King. Amen. That's my God. My God is able to do anything. Just trust Him. Trust Him with everything. I dear and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank You for this day. God, I thank You, Lord, for this service. God, I thank You, Lord, for the good singing. I thank You for the fellowship. God, I thank You, Lord, for all the folks that are here tonight. Thank You, Lord, for, uh, Lord, for our visitors who are here tonight. God, I thank You, Lord, for the man of God standing and preaching Your Word tonight. God, I thank You, Lord, for using Him. And God, I thank You, Lord, for what You've done here tonight. And God, I'm excited, Lord, about what You're going to do tomorrow night. God, I thank You, Lord, for what You're doing here at Lord Mount Baptist Church. Well, God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage everybody. I want to encourage everybody to come back again tomorrow night. Listen, we've got a choir. All those who sing the choir, please be here tonight. Uh, excuse me, tomorrow night. Because uh, the choir is going to be singing tomorrow night. And, uh, and then we're going to have pizza after the service. So everybody, invite people. Get them here. Amen. Hey, if you know somebody lost, invite them. Get them here. I promise you, they'll hear the gospel and have a chance to get saved. Amen. So let's get excited about it and get everybody here. Amen. God bless y'all. We're dismissed.